Okay, yes, TV Photo X 1.5 to FX, and welcome back to another video. Well, in this episode, yeah, we're gonna do the intro, so here we go. A rotating cube that makes you think about a beloved Hideo Kojima game franchise. Rotating potted plants. The discontinuation of film when films in the company name. The lens flavor of the day. The potential flavor substitute. And I am still sitting in a chair. Yeah, so in this episode we're actually gonna talk about this little nifty 50 of Nikon. It's the AF Nikkor 50mm f2.8, uh, excuse me, D version. There was also a pre-D version of this one. Only a slight difference is that this one is multi-coated, whilst the pre-D version wasn't. Well, <clears throat> yeah, as you know that now we have autumn outside, so you might not have the best landscapes or cityscapes, urban photography style, you know, but anyway, I went out, uh, since this is a end film era lens, it was introduced, this lens was actually introduced in 2002, and um, a lot of this information comes from Ken Rockwell's website, so I'm gonna link every of the uh, link in the description to everything I've gotten through to get the information about this lens. So, <clears throat> anyway, introduced in 2002, and to date, over 400,000 uh, units of this lens have been produced. Uh, so, yeah, quite a common piece of kit actually. Well, construction, what uh, can we say about it? Yeah. For the construction, this lens has six elements in five groups, and it is multi-coated, uh, which is uh, only for the D version. The pre-D version, apparently, was not multi-coated. It has a minimum focus distance of one and a half feet, or about 45 centimeters. It has seven straight aperture blades, and has a um, maximum aperture of f22. Well, that's uh, all well and good. Build quality, yeah, uh, this lens is mainly plastic construction and so on, but uh, even though it's this matte type of plastic that feels a little bit, uh, not flimsy, but uh, uh, compared to a lot of other Nikkor lenses, uh, you can definitely feel that it is a little bit uh, on the cheap. But uh, that, uh, keep in mind, the predecessor of this lens, the manual focus version, the now fairly fabled uh, Nikon Series E 50mm f1.8, uh, was also considered a budget lens in the beginning. And uh, this is basically the younger iteration of this, that lens. Keep in mind also there is a successor to this one, uh, which is still an F uh, mount lens, and it is the 50mm 1.8G series. So that's a little bit of the progression of this lens. So yeah, what else can we say? I went out basically on the town and took some images with this one to do a little bit of a you know, overview of what this can do. And I used, since it's a full frame, I used the D700 as a, you know, benchmark camera for this lens. And uh, yeah, I was actually quite surprised about the images that I actually managed to get. But there is a little bit of a caveat here. This is a little bit of an, uh, the images that I got when I used it on full aperture, that is 1.8 were a little bit 80s soft focus type deal. So in a sense, if you want tack sharp images, this is not really the lens for you if you want to use it at, it, as at its fastest aperture. Uh, that being said, if you stop down to about f2.8, f2, f2.8, uh, you will get much sharper results and at f5.6, you still have good uh, blurred out backgrounds, but still, uh, yeah, you have fairly sharp images. Let's see here then. Yeah, okay, uh, yeah, I think that that's all for this part, and we're gonna go over now to the uh, today's viewer question. 
And in today's viewer question, what is your take on Fujifilm seemingly dropping the film from its name? Well, at least it seems like so, and looking back a few years at the seemingly systematic uh, discontinuation of several loved film stocks throughout their lineup. It began with Pacfilm, then Acros, but then it came back as Acros 2, Velvia in the US because of some uh, chemicals, and now Pro 400H. Well, what is your take on it? We know that uh, a few manufacturers out there, upstarts and so on, are trying to do uh, new types of pack film because Fuji was the only company that made pack film. They had kind of this gentleman agreement with uh, Polaroid uh, back in the day. Uh, but uh, what is your opinion about it? And which film stock from Fuji? film would you miss the most if it was discontinued so put your uh, put your comment in the comment section below and we'll see uh, you in the next segment yeah so uh, what is my thoughts about this well this is a bit of a cheap not cheap in quality but uh, a little bit it feels a bit flimsy and so on, but uh, I, I would say that this lens you can get extremely cheap on eBay and other internet auction sites, which means that if this would be lost or if it would break on me and so on, it doesn't break the bank at least, so it is very replaceable. So that's a good thing about this lens, in my opinion. Uh, and just to show the fact, I got this basically uh, in its original box uh, with all the paperwork and so on. And uh, yeah, full disclosure, I paid 600 Swedish kroner for this one. And we're gonna talk a bit later on about how much uh, I've seen these go on eBay. But uh, yeah, I, that uh, going into that point, basically, I would say that now we're gonna go over to my full uh, in-depth uh, talk about this lens. For ease of use, this is about as basic as you can get with the built-in autofocus. Yes, it needs a camera body with a built-in autofocus screw drive motor and the aperture control. It is as stated as basic as it gets. If you put it on the camera as the happy uh, amateur, this is basically a, what can be considered a point-and-shoot lens. Then we have more seasonal professionals, like we have uh, videos from both the Kai Wong when he was a digital rev and Matt Granger has done a fair few lens videos about this and uh, you can see that it in the hands of a professional can yield fairly good to great results. So for ease of use I thereby give it a excellent. For fast glass, well this is an f1.8 lens that has its roots with the Series E 1.8 lens from the 70s and then you have the successor to this lens, the f1.8 G series. So in that aspect it has quite a proven track record for fast glass. Mind you, it is a bit soft at its full aperture of 1.8, but stopped down to f2 or 2.8 you get a plenty fast but still sharp uh, image in my opinion. So with that said, I can give this another excellent. Versatility. Well, this lens falls in what is smack dab in the middle of what is considered the normal focal range. That is uh, quite debated that it might go from about 35mm up to approximately 60 to 85mm. That depends on what is considered what the human eye perceives as its focal length. Keep in mind a couple of older vintage USSR made in the Soviet Union lenses usually uses 55mm as the normal or standard focal range. That being said, this lens has been used to, to from almost everything from street photography, though usually a more wide angle focal range is preferred, to close up macro with uh, different types of things such as extension tube, macro bellows, uh, you know, reverse mounts, etc. 
But this is not a Swiss Army knife of a lens in my opinion. It is a little bit limitating in the fact that uh, it's a little bit soft at full aperture f1.8 and also that the closest focusing distance of 1.5 feet or 45 centimeters is a little bit too far away in my opinion. In many cases when I try to take a photo, I want to get in a bit closer to my subject. Keep in mind also that when used on a DX camera, such as the 7000 series, excluding the D7500, or the excellent D500 series, this lens gets an equivalent focal range of about 75, which is in the more ballpark of classic portrait lenses, or at least a bit closer to the fabled 85 and so on and so forth. But if I would give you a different lens to have as an alternative to this one, it would be the brilliant Micro AF Micro Nikkor 60mm f2.8 D version. So that's a little bit of a more versatile lens in my opinion, but as this lens stands on its own right, I give it a good rating. Optics. Well, what can I say that hasn't been said many a times by YouTubers and bloggers alike? It is a six element design in five groups uh, with seven straight aperture or diaphragm blades and it has a d design that hunkers back to the not Nikkor but Nikon Series E system from the late 1970s. So it has a little bit of history back in time for Nikon. Though this D series actually got a little bit of a facelift with the multi-coating anti-reflection crystalline layering which was expanded upon in the successor to this one, the G series, that also got a, another element, which was an S spherical one. But as it stands on its own, it's a rugged, throw-in-the-bag, go-anywhere lens that has its use as a 50mm, though a bit soft, uh, but anyway, I give it a good rating. Durability. Well, this is a little bit on the cheap lens that is mainly made out of plastic constructions, though uh, glass elements and a metal bayonet mount. Uh, well, it's still the outer shell is a little bit of a matte plastic that feels a little bit cheap uh, when handled. But uh, when uh, thinking about how many units of this lens, over 400,000 produced, if this one would uh, fail on me, I wouldn't really cry about it and get a new one, because the price is so low that, uh, yeah, it is, it is what it is. But for that, I give it for durability another good rating. Well, X-Factor, that certain special something that makes a lens a bit unique. Well, if it's one thing that this lens does, is that it just simply works. It's no uh, m uh, no wonder it has uh, such nicknames as Plastic Fantastic and Nifty Fifty, but when thinking about the amount of units produced as stated, over 400,000, it is common and thereby low prices. Also, historically, this lens falls smack dab in the middle between the now a little bit fabled uh, manual focus uh, Series E 50mm 1.8 from the late 1970s and the current uh, generation Series G lens, uh, which uh, also has the seventh element, so which is a uh, aspherical one. So that makes it a little bit of the middle child in the range. Uh, keep in mind also it is plastic construction, more parts, it needs a camera body with an ill-built autofocus motor to work as intended, and so on and so forth. So yeah, I give it a bad rating. Not because the lens is bad in itself, but it is too common and it goes in between two lenses that one is more used for professionals nowadays and one that is the manual focus metal construction lens from the E series. So yeah, that's why I give it a bad rating. Current eBay prices. Well, this lens can still be bought new 
but uh, there is no really that much of a point of buying this uh, lens new and I've actually found that on eBay it goes from as low as 56 euros to 263 euros for brand new conditioned ones or 64 dollars to 302 dollars for brand new ones or 47 pounds up to 223 pounds so there is no really challenge to get a bargain on this lens so keep it uh, to the used market when it comes to this one that it's good condition good used condition and uh, I would say stay away from the new ones because there is not really that much of a point in paying these premium prices for this lens in what it is so for used examples eBay all the way so I give it a excellent well finally as an investment well simply put no this lens has been made about as many units as the fabled Atari ET cartridge, so over 400,000 units produced, it is extremely common, so not really that much of an investment lens and so on, unless you're planning to put it in some kind of time capsule, and then you have to think about Futurama style lengths of time that has to go before this one becomes that much of a collector's item in my opinion though I might be wrong but that's my opinion about it so as an investment uh, no this is something that is meant to be used and abused and when it has run its course uh, it isn't really that much uh, of a financial investment in order to you know get a new one and start over or if you want to upgrade because in the today's market also you have a plethora of third-party manufacturers that have their own 50 millimeter so and fast 50 millimeter lenses and Nikon Nikkor themselves have a their own plethora of faster 50 millimeter lenses compared to this one and also zoom range zoom lenses that dovetail and go over this focal range so yeah, that's all for me for now, so for an investment I give it a bad rating, but all in all, that's all for me for this lens, and uh, see you soon. Yeah, and as stated in this little in-depth uh, review, um, there is one lens that I would say is a better alternative. If you're in the market of a normal, normal range lens. This is a cheap and cheerful nifty 50 plastic fantastic lens, no question about it. But if I would be so bold and say that there is another one in Nike course lineup that I would say is a better value and more versatile in my opinion uh, than the 50mm f1.8. So if you add 10 millimeters to the focal range uh, and uh, save up a little bit more I would say that this is a much better alternative. And what is it? It's the AF Micro Nikkor 60mm 2.8D version. Why is this basically my choice over this one? This is more uh, versatile in what it can do. Yes, it's a little bit more uh, closer focus distance uh, than the 50mm. This is a 60, but still, uh, when you put this on a uh, APS-C crop factor camera like the D7000 series or the D500 series and this one becomes basically a 90 millimeter so you're still in that portrait range when it comes to classic portrait range or traditional portrait range uh, when it comes to an APS-C camera or DX camera and uh, yeah you know it, on, if you have this on a full frame like the D700 it is great for outdoor you know bug photography for you know portraits for a little bit of cityscape uh, landscape and so on i know that a lot of street photographers prefer wider angle lenses like a 28 35s and so on but uh, yeah i would say that this is a little bit of a better buy uh, if you want a more of a versatile lens than the 50 millimeter f 1.8 The biggest reason why I would say that this is a better buy is the fairly far closest uh, focus distance of 45 centimeters, 0.45 meters, 45 centimeters, 
4 decimeters and 5 centimeters or for the imperial guys uh, one and a half feet so yeah when I used this on my little photo walk uh, the biggest thing drawback I had was first it was a little bit too soft for my liking on the widest aperture and uh, secondly it uh, when I tried to focus, the minimum focus distance felt a bit far. I would have much preferred this lens if it uh, could focus down to about uh, 20 centimeters or uh, 0.2 meters or, yeah, you know, a little bit closer, you know. That's the biggest drawback in my opinion. But as it stands on its own, it is a really great lens that doesn't break the bank. You really should buy it used on eBay or on a any other photo website uh, that is a reputable seller and uh, I would say that don't really try to get this new because these are still available in new old stock because there were so many made of them but I think that that's not really really practical to buy this brand new so yeah I used one of these really cheap and cheerful you will have a lot of fun with it it's just this is basically one of those lenses if you put it on uh, as a, the happy amateur, if you're a film shooter or whatever, this is basically what can be considered a point and shoot lens. So in that aspect, for travel and so on, really good, it's lightweight, it won't uh, weigh you down or anything, it's good in that aspect. But for the more pro high-end or serious amateur, it's a good tool to have in the toolbox, but it's kind of limiting in my opinion, so yeah. I would say that either the 60 millimeter, in my experience, is a better jo a better choice, and there are some other zo uh, Nikkor zoom lenses and so on that goes into this range that I would actually prefer to have to have the more versatility. But that's my opinions. So as always, this is Tobias Bergstrom from TB Photo X 1.5 to FX, and I'd like to see you guys in the next video. And as always. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. So take care from now on. Bye.